Hello chess friends, this is Philip Master Valero Limov for ChessLecture.com and in our lecture today I'm going to continue the discussion of some of the most typical and interesting attacks in chess and right now I want to explain how to attack against a opposite castled king for example when we have castled in the queen side and the opponent has castled on the king side or exactly the opposite what kind of of ideas and typical combinations could eventually arise in such situations so I wanna start with a game played between Spassky and Petrosian in their 19 match played in Moscow USSR in 1969 so in this game I want to exactly explain some of the basic and most important uh, concepts to be known when we are providing attack against a um, opposite castle king. So Spassky had white and he played e4, black played c5, and white played knight up to f3. Here black decided to enter into the main variations of the uh, knight orf with d6, pawn up to d4, now c takes d4, and knight takes d4. Of course uh, there are many continuations for black in this position, but the knight orf actually occurs after knight f6, and when white plays knight c3, black simply puts his a7 pawn up to a6. So he has an idea to play something like pawn e7 to e5, in case white plays bishop e2 or e bishop e3, and the knight orf has uh, also very good attacking ideas, and it could also transport, transport into some Chevenningian schemes if black decides to bring his e7 pawn up to e6. Now in this position White decided to play bishop to g5, so that's the main line of the knight orf. Black played the simple knight b8 to d7, and here White decided to bring his light square bishop up to c4. For now, um, actually the, the development with bishop g5 and bishop c4 is remaining as one of the most active opening structures for White in the knight orf, so the bishops on g5 and c4 take really very good attacking positions, and as we know, for every successful attack that we want to start, we need first an active development, actively placed pieces. This means that we our pieces should be placed on more advanced squares, especially important is to have pieces in the opponent's um, middle of the board, like bishop, the bishop on g5. So black played queen a5 in this position. That's a very popular move. The queen takes a good square and now attacks on the g5 bishop. And white simply defended that bishop with queen to d2. So here, black decided to play h6, which is not really a very useful move. Um, fortunately, this move is actually <coughs> being like forgotten for some time after this game, but still some players like to play h7 to h6 and there are still some variations, even main lines in which black is uh, considering to play h7 as h6 in case white is going to castle on the queen side. In reality now h6 is becoming a target, so if black is about to castle on the king side and for example white is going to castle on the queen side, what will happen is that for example now in this position no matter where what will play his bishop, uh, after f3 and something like g2 up to g4, what will easily be able to employ like uh, g2 to g4, h2 to h4, and even a move like g5. So he will easily open up files right in front of the black king, and certainly he will uh, manage to um, create even direct threats against the black king. So the h6 pawn will become a target. White simply captured the knight on f6, winning one tempo. We know about the, spa the, the time and space advantage, which is really um, very important for the every successful attack. So after knight f6, white simply castles in the queen side. Already, he has completed the development of his forces, and the black king, as we can see on e8, is still in the center. So that could be a problem. For this reason, black decides to bring it on a safe place as fast as he can, because otherwise white will be able to promote attack against an uncastled king. So black played e6 in this game, and of course, white simply finished the development of all of his pieces by bringing his king side rook to e1. So already white has his rooks, his bold rooks on the central e and d files. He has his pieces like the knight on e4, the bishop on c4, and the pawn on e4 centralized. And also he has some ideas to bring up f2 to f4, and generally he can even set e4 to e5 as a potential threat.
Many possibilities are possible, but generally with his centralized pieces in tune, White can create really a lot of threats against the Black King and his position. So here Black decided to play Bishop e7, of course a logical continuation. So um, eventually <coughs> Black wants to castle on the king side, but really uh, that's not going to be so careful, because right now when Black castles on the king side, we see that the h6 pawn will become the target, and after f3 to g4, or even f4, h3 to g4, and g5, White will easily open up files right in front of the Black King. So White played f4 in this position, and Black decided to play the simple castles. Now as we can see, already Black will prepare some queen side attack, with, uh, beginning with something like b7 to b5, probably uh, after he develops his uh, uh, bishop on d7, he'll play b5, then he will transfer his ki king side rook to c8, and the queen side rook will go to b8, and eventually black will continue with b7 to b5 up to b4, and mm, a lot of white's pieces will, be will have to go back, and his queen side will uh, become more vulnerable. So white decided to take his bishop away, still before black has b7 to b5 played, and black played in this position to move for k8. So here, in this case, White simply brought his king on a kind of more safe spot on b1. That's one of the typical moves in such kind of Sicilian structures. So the king on b1 could be accessed in a more difficult way. And in the same time, it covers the a2 pawn. So additionally, White's king is more safe. And Black played the simple bishop f8. Already in this position, Black has the idea to support the g7 pawn with that bishop and maybe to make the king's side position like more safe. However, here I want to tell you about some, some of the important and most common terms which appear in the games where players have castles on opposite sides. So I will go over some of the most important of them now. <coughs> First of all, we should know that pushing pawns towards the enemy king is really viable. This is a great way to soften up his position. This is a uh, kind of very strong way because the pawns are not needed to protect uh, our, our king because, because it's castled on the other side of the board. So we can use our pawns against the, his king in order to push them forward and certainly to open up files and additional possibilities for our pieces. So pushing pawns towards the enemy king is always the most important thing to really um, catch him and certainly to employ a, a faster and stronger attack. So right now, White decided to not lose time, as we know the time is really very important, and he played g4. Now as you can see, White is sacrificing a pawn, so his pawn on g4 is hanging, but in general, when Black decides to take it, he does that in the game, generally the g file will be exactly open, so on the price of one pawn, White will directly open up that file right in front of the Black King. So, right now, after g4, black played knight xg4, it was probably better to start with bishop d7, or maybe even e5, but black decided that this pawn should be taken, because it will go otherwise on g5, and he decided to take it. After knight xg4 in this position, white simply employed the move queen to g2 on the way. So, the queen is taking a really good position, and actually, after the first 10 that I told you, uh, about pushing the pawns towards the enemy king, it's also a very good idea to use the second and exactly make maximum use of the open files or semi-open files leading towards the enemy king. This means to introduce the major pieces like queen as, and the, even the rooks right in front of the opponent king because they will create certainly the threats first. So that is how we can create the threats and eventually make even more problems so we c that we can advance our, our plan simply. If a file is available, then line up heavy pieces on it, like weak to g1, and it is sometimes worth sacrificing the pawn or even some other, other piece just to open up a file because then we have a chance to really create direct threats and the opponent will experience a lot of difficulties to defend. For example, right now the knight on g4 is hanging and he black plays like e5 to protect it with his bishop or it simply has knight to f5 and it's very unpleasant because in, in reality after bishop takes f5, e takes f5 and let's say knight f6, white will st black will still have to bring that knight back then white can simply take the pawn on b7 and we see that with the combination of queen and the bishop on b3, 
what is creating a threat on the F7 pawn and black can't play like rook E7 because A8 rook is hanging. So there are a lot of threats like rook G1 will also be available next move and a lot of combinations will come forward against the black king. So that is why white tries to use the his own resources right in front of the black king and queen G2 is a very short way to uh, directly represent the pieces on the open files. So queen to g2 and right now um, eventually black decided to play the move knight f6 to take that knight backwards and of course would follow this plan to bring the uh, major pieces right in front of the black king. So he played the move rook to g1. Already black has to think about his own plan just because if he considers to defend his own king he will uh, it, he will actually lose a lot of time and he will have to delay his queenside play and that's why he decided to play bishop d7 and generally to prepare some moves like b5 and uh, let's say a move like b4 to advance his play over there but right now white plays the move f5 which is creating a particular threat to take on e6 and black will have one more weak spot in his own territory now basically it's very important also to think about a third turn and exactly that we should always think about eliminating of your opponent's piece, uh, pieces and best defenders around the king if one of your opponent's pieces is holding up the attack then try to eliminate it here is an example with the move f5 white wants to exchange the pawn on e6 and then we see that the g6 square will be very weakened. Also, by exchanging the F pawns, what will certainly open up a new file, like the F file for additional perspectives and attacks against the Black King. And it might seem that after that move, eventually White will have a, a lot of a lot of threats. So the the idea of eliminating the opponent's defenders is really very useful and it can actually serve very well for for any kind of positions. For instance, in this position after the move f5, White wants to open up the f file, and in the same time he's following something else. Now let me tell you one very important concept when attacking. Probably it's above everything, all of the all of uh, that we know. In most of the times, in most of the cases, it is essential for a player to attack the enemy's king in the uh, shortest time possible. But in order to do it with maximum strength and, of course, to have a success, it is very important to take the initiative. Now, I don't know if you know what initiative is, but generally the initiative means an opportunity to sequently attack the opponent with threats in a row. Like... For example, we don't really create a threat. A threat is one time event. We create a threat, we threat some piece, and the opponent defends. So that's it. We don't have anything. The initiative literally means when we can practically prom promote a couple of moves which will contain attack. For example, we attack on some piece, he defends, and we create a new attack. So this is what we call initiative. Once a player has the initiative and he creates threats in a row, the defending side will be on the back foot, spending time defending. So if a player is defending, we know that he will not have time to attack. So that is how we can advance our attack and that is how we can eventually make it successful. So we don't have to give uh, the opponent the time to attack faster and more uh, like uh, in, in, a, in a kind of shorter time than us. So that is why we can try to take the initiative. So the initiative we can take when we always try to really choose the active moves, which will promote threats. So sometimes we can see that we can create a double threat. For example, I'm not saying a kind of double threat in the, in the uh, certain way, but for example, we threat, and in, this, in the next move after he defends, we threat once again. So he can defend and we create a new threat. So this this way we will actually take the initiative and we will be able to um, con convert that into a very strong attack which will actually give us success. So that is what White wants with the move f5. He's directly attacking on the e6 pawn. And right now, if black tries to include his queen on defense, like to put it on e5, well then, White can even play something like, say, um, knight f3. And we see that this queen has to go away, and when this goes away, White can even employ moves like e5, or even knight to g5 probably sacrifices, so it's really difficult. So in the game, there were champion Petrosian, uh, actually Spaskin Petrosian, they were 
like chess guy guidance for uh, gigans for that time, and so after the move f5, Black decided to use the idea to take away the king on a kind of more uh, safer position. So on h8, it's kind of covered with his pawns on g7 and h6. So after that move, what White decided to do is basically to introduce the rook from d1 onto f1, and ev already when he has all of his pieces set and exactly represent in front of the black king, possible threat like f takes e6 and even rook takes f6 could be available. So considering this, uh, looking at this very strong and dangerous threat, what black decided to do is of course to take his queen backwards and try and defend that f6 knight by playing queen to, d, queen to d8. So right after queen to d8, generally in this position it seems that the support is good, but yet it's not so good. In fact, we always already know that in general, when a player wants to attack and in the same time he chooses to take a piece backwards, like the queen on a5, for, uh, from a5 on d8, in general that could be really decisive. So his attack could lose all of his power and of course that's, that's now uh, particularly bad. So, uh, but any, anyway, he can't go other way. For example, if he plays e5, now there is this beautiful knight e6 coming. After f takes e6, f takes e6, and bishop takes e6, there could be like rook takes f6 winning for white. So, for instance, in this position, if black takes the, the rook, there would be like bishop takes e6, and the checkmate either from g8 or g7 is simply unstoppable. So the threats are very strong, and in fact, knight e6 will either make the threat of rook takes f6, or uh, simply uh, black, will be, well, black will lose. So, um, in fact, after f5, the only opportunity for black is, as he as chose in the game, to play queen to d8. But now after f6, e6, of course, by opening up file, what is able to introduce his rook into the attack, f6, e, f6, e. And the simple move of e5, with this move, white, what white does is that he's simply opening up additional idea to introduce the other pieces that are not really in play. And these are the knight on c3 plus the bishop on b3. If white manages to introduce them into the attack against the black king, there will be a lot of upcoming threats. Now, e5 is mainly with the idea of knight e4, and I guess you see how the bishop on b3 can be, can be introduced. Well, that's quite easy. Once the knight moves to e4, white will want to do c3 and then bring the bishop back to c2. So from that square, eventually, white can uh, employ even like queen g6 and the bishop and queen is having a battery to the h7 will create a really strong threat. So black took d takes e5 and of course white simply introduces knight into the attack with knight ie4. Now we see that there is a checkmating threat like knight x f6 and then eventually the g8 square will be hanging so white uh, has the battery of the queen and rook plus the combinations that he can create. This is becoming very strong. And in reality, we see that after knight e4, if black takes that knight, white has the very beautiful checkmate upcoming with rook takes f8 check, actually eliminating the most important protector of the uh, king side position, dark square bishop. So after rook takes f8, white has the very beautiful checkmate on g7. And in reality, after the move knight e4, if black takes e takes d4, White has one more combination. There is rook takes f6. So both of black's pieces, the knight on f6 and the bishop on f8, are undermined. So right now, white has the idea to take one of them and eventually to win the game. So after the move of knight takes e4, white has only one possibility, like all, an only move, and this is to bring the knight forward, this knight which has been threatened. Black plays it on h5, and in fact, after this move, White just plays the move queen g6. So here we see the attack against the black knight on h5. And in general, there are a lot of upcoming threats against the black king position. So after queen g6 right now, uh, well, now we see that we take to takes h5 is coming. And in the same time, an in-between move like knight f4 does not really help black to defend this position. Now there is a very beautiful combination. If black goes with knight f4, white well, can simply sacrifice on f4 and his active potential right in front of the black king gives him the win. After rook takes f, e takes f, white well, simply has this amazingly strong knight f3, so the knight actually is intending to jump either on e5 or g5 with unstoppable checkmate threats against the black king. So after queen b6, for example, 
where he can play in this position. Another amazing move, which will actually include his rook into the attack, rook g5. Now you see, we see that if black takes that rook, what will simply recapture with the e knight, and now queen h7 is unstoppable. And after the move, rook g5, when black plays something like Bishop to c6, white has the simple idea of knight f6. Now, three of white pieces are simply creating unstoppable threats right in front of the black king. Now, if black takes g takes f, white has queen a g to g a, the checkmate. And if he plays like h takes g, we see that there is a threat of queen to h7. Again, we have a mate on the board. So, eventually, one move uh, 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 before, knight f6 was not so possible, because black would have sacrificed his queen for that rook, and then, basically, after the take, g takes a f6, he will get enough material equivalent, like two rooks for a queen. So, with the move rook g, g5, basically, white is uh, eliminating that kind of alternative from black, and in the same time, that rook is untouchable, because after knight takes g5, black will get checkmated. An amazing move that basically finishes the game. And it finishes it even in a more beautiful way. For example, if black goes bishop c6, knight f6, and bishop e4, trying to make some complications. Now, if white takes the bishop, then the rook will hang. White has the very beautiful queen takes h6 that actually finishes the game. g takes h6 is first, and then rook g8 checkmate is coming, because the knight on f6 takes away h7, and g8 from the black king, and everything's over. A very beautiful combination with the uh, white's tremendously strong peace fist right in front of the black king. So in fact, black didn't want to go this way, and so in, in, in fact, in the game, what black did after the move of uh, queen to g6 was to play e takes d4, so that's probably the only way to rescue, but in fact, after the beautiful move of knight to g5, black was forced to resign. So that is a simple uh, way to win the game, because now after knight g5, there is a checkmating threat on h7, and if black takes that knight, there is this simple queen takes to h5 check, king g8, one more forcing move, we check on f7, and after the simple king h7 or h8, doesn't really matter, what follows us up with rook to f3, and then rook to h3 is basically unstoppable. Like after e5, well, you can even play queen h5 checkmate, simply because the king has no square left to go on g8. That's a very beautiful example to show how exactly uh, attack against a, an opposite castled king could be promoted, but let me tell you, once again, the three more important things. So first of all, it is always to care about the pushing of pawns towards the uh, enemy king. Always consider to push the pawns, because generally, they are those pieces which can open up files. If you only attack against with pieces against this castled king, well, sometimes you can have success, but um, uh, but some other time when the opponent has enough enough good support, or maybe like a fian schedule, it will be a lot more difficult to uh, really destroy his pawn bastions only with pieces. That's why we push pawns forward and we follow the idea pawns for pawns and pieces against pieces. So we exchange pawns against his pawns, and then we attack with our pieces against his pieces. That's the major tip. The second is always to, to make maximum use of the open and semi-open files to introduce our pieces on them so that we can create even stronger threats. And the third one is always to eliminate the opponent's best defenders. By doing it, like why did with the move like uh, f5 and, and introducing all of his pieces on the king side, he was able to employ those very very dangerous threats and of course to finish the game with a beautiful combination. Amazing game and I think that those tips could be very useful to you when you are on your own trying to employ attack against an opponent's kink which is castled on an opposite side than yours. Thank you very much. This was Fidemaster Valer Lilov for ChessLecture.com. Thanks and see you next time.